Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation. Tonight, Idaho Senator Steve Sims joins us for a conversation. Good evening. Republican Party platform work writers were hard at work in Dallas today, and they made a preliminary decision today that could prove controversial for President Reagan and other Republicans. The drafters of economic planks in the platform voted today to rule out any increases in taxes next year. White House aides had reportedly tried to soften that language to leave the president some room to maneuver on the tax issue since Democratic presidential candidate Walter Mondale keeps saying that both he and Mr. Reagan will have to raise taxes next year regardless of who's elected. But only Mondale says he's willing to tell the American people that he would do so. A political debate over taxes and the economy is one subject we'll be discussing tonight with Idaho Republican U.S. Senator Steve Sims. He's a member of both the Senate Budget and Finance Committees. Good to have you here, sir. Good evening, Mark. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. Let me ask you about that tax uh, question. Should, uh, should the president have some flexibility in the Republican platform to maneuver, or should we just say no taxes? Well, I think we should say no taxes, but I think uh, he'll have all the flexibility he needs anyway. And I don't say that to make light of the platform, but I think it's fine to have the platform as clear as possible that uh, the Republican Party stands for balancing the budget by way of reducing expenditures rather than raising taxes. And uh, that's about as clear as you can make it. And if there is some, uh, if the Congress forces something on the President later on, that's another question. But I, I don't think that there's any reason why the people at the White House are making such fuss over this, frankly. Uh, well, the rank and file I, why Republic, are they making such a fuss? Well, the, 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 the reason they're making the fuss over it is it's uh, common sense tells you, as the President has said, that it's very difficult for a president to never say never, as he says. Uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen, or none of us know what is going to happen in 1985 uh, in terms of uh, what the demands will be. But as I see the budget now and the numbers that I've looked at and at the, the revenue flow that's coming to the Federal Treasury, there simply is no reason for us to talk about a tax increase in 1985 because the revenues are pouring into the Federal Treasury, and we need to be talking about how we can reduce the expenditures. There's going to be, I think, some $400 billion in increased revenues over the next three or four years to the Federal Treasury. The secret to it is, is don't spend all of it, and the budget will come out balanced by 1988. And that's what I think the President's trying to say. Why don't we look at that instead of taking the easy way out, which is what uh, Vice President Mondale is doing and saying we'll just raise taxes and then we don't have to interfere with any of the special interest spending. So are you saying that if we just uh, basically sit tight for three or four years that the, that the federal budget deficit will take care of itself? No, not entirely. But uh, to some degree, yes. But to go out and raise taxes to solve the problem would be very, I think, uh, disenchanting to the to the taxpayers and to the public, and they'd say, well, there they go again in Washington. It's the same old story. So I, I think that the platform writers for the Republican Party are correct in doing this. I've personally visited with Senator Caston and Congressman Kemp and others who have been working on that plank, Congressman Lott, uh, and urge them to put a, just a no-tax plank in the platform. So it makes it very clear. So people out in the country, when they're voting this fall, they can make a decision. If they want to vote uh, for a guaranteed tax increase, then vote for Walter Mondale. If they want to vote for no tax increase, they hope, vote for Ronald Reagan. And that's about the best guarantee they can get, whatever's in the platform. Well, Mondale's argument, though, uh, is, it seems to me, is that he says, I'm willing to tell you what I'm going to do, and the president's not willing well, to tell you what he's Well, the president can to. tell him that he's not going to raise taxes. That's what he needs to tell him, period. Now, if Congress raises taxes, that's not the president raising taxes. And maybe later on he may be forced into something, but I, I personally think that the right way to start is in a position that you don't want to raise taxes. Now, Mr. Grace, for example, has come up with uh, 2,475 or 74 
recommendations of how to save some $424 billion. 2,478, I, just, right. I thought you might mention <laughs> right. that. So 2,478. Well, uh, you know, there, there's one exa example. Now, there's many of those things are highly controversial and wouldn't sell very good in certain parts of the country. However, if you could only do a third of them or half of them, but see, part of the president's problem is that his uh, budget director has come to the conclusion, and other people in Washington, that it's impossible to get all this spending cut. So once they decide that they really have cut all they can cut, that the only way they can solve it then is raise taxes, then it's fait accompli, or it's a, it's a it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, and it's what not I would just do is, Democrats yeah. who are suggesting that. No, there is a few Republicans. Stockman and, and, and Senator Mike, Dole, for example. Senator Dole thinks that we better not get ourselves completely cornered. Now, Senator Dole does encourage cutting spending, but he also is saying we've got to uh, face reality that we're going to have to raise some taxes. Well, well, my point is, if your budget director is saying that, as Mr. Stockman is saying then you should get a new budget director. Doesn't this... Get one uh, that believes he can cut spending. Get somebody who thinks like Peter Grace and put him in the budget office. Then at least they start out from a positive point of view. It's, it's self-defeating. If you don't believe you can do it, you can't. You have no chance. Doesn't this point up uh, a certain amount of... Uh well, disarray, if you will, in the top levels of the, of the Reagan administration I don't over think, this basic issue. Well, it appears probably to be more disarray than I think there really is. Now, we had, before the Joint Economic Committee last week, we had uh, Secretary Reagan testify. Right. And I was there for the entire hearing and asked him a series of questions about this specific issue. Now, the Secretary of Treasury couldn't have been more clear about the position. And he was flat, unequivocal, say there'll be no tax increases, there's no plans for any tax increases, we're not doing anything about tax increases. And then when it came out in the news, it still was saying, but there's a chance that maybe after 1985 there may have to be some kind of a tax increase. From some offhand thing he'd said, I, don't, I did not catch that he'd said it, but yet, so I don't think there's as much disarray. It's true probably that Mike uh, Deaver, and Jim Baker at the White House would like to leave the flexibility a little more the open. Wires, the wire services right. were reporting today were the ones who were bringing who, who, the pressure who, to bear on the platform. On this. But as far as the president himself is concerned, I've talked with him personally about this, he does not want any tax increases. And so if he even says anything like, I don't want any tax increases, period, unequivocally, but somebody says, then they come back and say, but Mr. President, what happens if the Congress forces you into a tax increase? Well, he says, you know, it's bad for a president to never say never, you know, yeah. to, to ever be putting myself completely in the corner. So then it appears to be more disarray. But I think the bottom line is this. Mondale will guarantee you a tax increase. Reagan is going to try to do it by reducing government spending and hopefully be successful and not ever have to have a revenue increase over and above our present tax code. Now, that does not mean that more revenues won't flow into the Treasury. There's going to be more money coming in just because of the growth in the economy. Every, revenues are going up every year. Let me ask you, you, you mentioned the Grace Commission's uh, report uh, on 2,478 mm -hmm. ways to reduce the, the cost of government to make things work more efficiently. Uh, George Will wrote a column this past week on one recommendation of the Grace Commission. Which would be, which would alter the way that uh, we charge for electricity that's produced at Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And he writes in his column, and I don't know how you, late how you voted on this, that uh, the Republican-controlled Senate voted 64 to 34, with every senator from west of the Missouri voting to continue the subsidy. You in that group, I take. Yes. So you went against the Grace Commission on, on that, that particular, particular issue. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, the first place is that. That's a little bit, you know, George Will, who I have a high opinion of and respect very much, and I agree with many of the things he writes. I disagree with his particular viewpoint of the entire Grace Commission and specifically of that issue. The Hoover Dam is, you know, it's a little bit different than, say, the Air Rock Dam, but the Air Rock Dam is, is paid for. You know, the farmers have paid back the Federal Treasury and paid for it, so there isn't a big subsidy out there. The Hoover Dam is the same way. What they were trying to do with the Hoover Dam is put some improvements on the power generating facilities, new generators and so forth, and be able to sell bonds in order to do it. If they could only have a contract for one or two or three years, they couldn't sell bonds in the financial markets to pay for it. 
So there's another side to that story. And it's true that the Western senators uh, all voted against the proposition. And in the East, they pay more for power than we do in the West, in the Pacific Northwest. Well, the Grace, the, Commission, the Grace Commission's argument, though, in making the recommendation was to do away or at least reduce a federal subsidy that a relatively few number of Americans enjoy in Arizona and Colorado. And Arizona, Nevada, and California. And California. Get it all. Uh, why not do that? Well, I suppose you could do it. However, you see, is it a, is it a subsidy that uh, that we're paying uh, with the Hoover Dam? Uh, the, a lot of the power in the Hoover Dam was used during World War II to make the fire bombs and magnesium bombs and so forth in the war effort. Then it's been sold into commercial contracts, and the people have have set the pattern of what the electri electrical rates are based on the power supplies of Hoover Dam, something that was built some, what, 30, 50, when was it completed? 1935 or something, 36? But by, but by increasing but, those rates, you're, you're talking about a but political problem, the, aren't you're, you? That, well, that, you're talking, that's oh, these, sure. That's why these Sure, uh, except that, except that when they pick out, anywhere. I mean, when they pick out, the, the, uh, when the Grace Commission picks out that particular item, out of the 2,478 recommendations. Uh, that Hoover Dam is already built, and there is already a rate structure built into it from the capital costs that have been put in there. So whatever subsidy there was has already been accomplished. You know, now, if you could get enough people, I guess, to vote to take it away from uh, I would prefer, rather than charging them a higher rate for it, if that's the case, it would be better, in my opinion, to start looking at ways to privatize the public power uh, facilities so that they could, in fact, go private and uh, remove the government from it altogether. But that's probably a little late to talk about that, too. Uh, you know, we've got this terrible mess in the Northwest with the whoop situation. And uh, if you think back, it would have been very nice if the, if the state of Washington, for example, where they had the Washington public power system that got in all the whoops problems, it's too bad that it wasn't the private shareholder, uh, private utilities that were doing that instead of the public utilities. And they wouldn't be in the big mess that they're in up there now that some of us may end up paying for it over the years. And, and maybe that's what should have happened with Hoover Dam is after well, 30 years they should have sold the dam or something. It seems but, to me uh, that, that every time you talk about things like that, you almost get stoned by the by all of the people who are against private ownership. So uh, that doesn't go over too well either. But it seems to me, though, let me just go back to the, to Will's point here, which uh, seems to me to be important in in, in discussion the of the of the Grace Commission's recommendations. That when one of these recommendations uh, hits close to home, as a, a recommendation to drop the subsidies on mm -hmm. Hoover Dam power does that suddenly um, fellows like you who are all for cutting the budget go run and hide and vote against it. Well, them. except that... And, see, that, and that's the... See, I the point is, the point is, point is that's is, the though, political Mark, problem really making isn't. these kinds of cuts and government. I don't know how they figured that that's part of the budget. There's no liability to the federal budget on Hoover Dam. There's no liability to the federal budget. It's not, it's not a losing... Well, the the money federal losing. government could be making more money off of selling that power, though. Well, if the federal government thinks it's, if we think it's proper for the federal government to try to make a profit off of electric, electricity that it generates in the Hoover Dam so that it can pass out more subsidy checks somewhere else to buy more votes, I mean, that's, that's you know, that's a thing, that, that's a question that's hard to answer. Okay, Because it's so, just politics in that case. Okay, so it's, this, a, it's a federally owned dam, and it is not, it, it was put in there to help just develop the Colorado Basin for one thing, but also to help develop electricity so that you could have a commercial area develop, not put in there to right. generate power to sell at the highest price possible. Now, I'm not, I don't know how much they could sell that power for. Maybe they could sell it for more than they're, they're paying, they're selling it for now. But if this recommendation, uh, just one recommendation out of the the 2,400 that the Grace Commission recommends mm -hmm. can't even it can't even well, get 35 let me, votes. Let in me the ask you this: How serious no. can the Congress be about well, really cutting we, the budget? We can be serious because see, you're comparing apples with oranges. Let's let's compare this with the Idaho Power Company's rates off of the Brownlee Dam, for example. The Brownlee Dam is already built. There's been a capital expenditure. There's a rate structure from the electricity that the Idaho Power Company produces off of Brownlee Dam. What would happen if they came in and said they were going to double the rates tomorrow? How would they go about doing it? They've got to go to the Public Utility Commission, right? And they've got to get approval to raise the rates. On what basis? What's their added cost? They have to demonstrate 
that they've had a, a whole new cost structure that's increased. That is not demonstrable in the case of the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam has already been built. It's been paid for. It's a structure that's there. They're, man they're, they're working it. What the Congress want, what they wanted to do was to have a contract, a new contract for another 30 years so they could sell some bonds to put some new generators in. But their rate structure, just to say that if they're going to raise the rates, double the rates or triple the rates, that that would help the federal budget. That's a completely different question. There's yeah, no I, drain I, I on the federal budget from Hoover Dam. Do, but doesn't this doesn't this illustrate though the the merits of Hoover Dam aside for a moment? Well, the difficulty. No, what the it illustrates is what it illustrates in, in trying is trying to make some well, of these changes. That's true, and it illustrates the political difficulty and the market difficulty of government ownership versus private ownership. And I don't have an answer for that as long as we have all this government ownership. We're surrounded by it here in Idaho. We've got government grasshoppers eating up our fields and but so Senator, forth. But, Senator, you voted you voted to keep the government ownership just the way it is in the case well, of Well, the Dam. choice wasn't, if, if the choice would have been to auction it off or to sell it for so many billion dollars, I might have taken another <laughs> okay. look at that. That really wasn't the yeah. choice I had. The uh, choice you're, you're was either allow them to continue to operate and sell power or to completely disrupt uh, their ability to run the, the project the way they've been running it. So the choice isn't quite as black and white as uh, as, it, as Howard Metzenbaum and others would like to make people believe. Let me let me ask you this. But it's, then. you're right and on target, though. It's a difficult problem. There's a lot of things in the Grace Commission that a lot of congressmen and senators are going to really scream about. Yeah. Of that uh, roughly 200 billion, a little less than 200 billion dollar budget deficit, how much of that realistically could be reduced by uh, cutting the budget, by cutting the federal budget, reducing With, programs. Without taking any benefits away from any person who now receives a federal check, whether it's Social Security, uh, veterans benefit, a civil service pension, uh, whatever, without taking anything away from any American and without having any increases in federal salaries for a two or th for a three year period, you could cut it in half, just like that. And, and that would shield everybody that's below the poverty level. You could take half of the deficit. It would save $235 billion in three years. Just that one single thing alone. Yet the, yet the president says he wants to uh, go ahead and grant a cost of living increase to Social it's Security. It's already been done. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I think it's a mistake. I think we should appraise, we should, an we should uh, 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 carefully appraise how we got in the situation we're in. You see, the wage index has not kept up with the price index. Now, of course, the president has done a lot of things that have helped, and uh, there have been a lot of things happen, like the deregulation of oil and so forth. Well, the, the reduction we've had in the deficit, in the uh, growth of spending and so forth. So inflation is not the problem it was. So consequently, the cost of living adjustments are not the problem they were. Three years well, ago. Well, it's not a very efficient way to cut the budget to start granting cost of living increases that the law said you didn't even need to agree That's to true. Grant. Now, they're telling us well, now. Why did Ronald Reagan do that? Politics. Absolute, pure and simple politics. He wanted to be sure that Tip O'Neill didn't have an issue to hammer him with this fall, that he was somehow against the senior citizens. Is that an agreeable trade off to you? I, no, I think he should. I think it's a mistake. But interestingly enough, after the fact, and after the fact, after it had already been done and it had been gone through the Congress and gone to the White House, some of the accountants came up with an analysis that it actually, because of the way the formula works, that this will actually end up saving money. Now, I haven't really carefully studied those figures, but I've been told this. Senator Dole has put the explanation of this in the congressional record, and I haven't read it yet, I must confess. But what I'm told is, that because of those people who become eligible in FY in fiscal year 85 and fiscal year 86, who would then be eligible to go back and pick up the COLA when it went above 3 percent, they'd have to go back and pay right. more, that it will be cheaper to have done it this way than it would have to have uh, That sounds gone like ahead. that Washington, D.C. Well, logic. That, that that's what it sounded about. like. That's exactly what I said <laughs> when I was told this. But I was told this by several people that said that they had analyzed it and that was correct. But it seemed to me like this was a good time to uh, not keep on that bandwagon and to uh, start looking at ways to try to put the wage index and the price index back in balance. And that's all I'm talking about is get it back in balance. You don't have to reduce anybody's benefits if we could have stopped increasing them. Now, of course, we're not having the inflation we were having.
thank heavens. So we don't have people on a fixed income in a real squeeze with finding out that every day the prices of things they buy are going up. That's not the case right now. Let me talk to you just a little bit about wilderness uh, in the time that remains. You were quite critical last week of Governor Evans and his call for regional negotiations among the various mm -hmm. parties who have an interest in the wilderness issue uh, as a way to reach a compromise. Why is that a bad idea? Well, the reason it's a bad idea is that on one side of the argument, uh, the governor and all his uh, supporters are always critical of me that, they, that uh, they're afraid I want to privatize any land or that I, they, I said the state of Idaho ought to own more of this land and you know, you know that old story that's gone on for years in this state that I think the government already has too much land in Idaho and owns too much of it, has too much to say about it. But that's their argument. Well, we've had this problem going on for 10 years, since 12 years since I've been in the Congress. I tried to get it settled in 79 when Senator Church had the River No Return Wilderness Bill to get it settled completely. Senator McClure has held hearings all over the state of Idaho properly with the committee. The House has had hearings. The governor has testified. We've got thousands and thousands of pages of testimony and everybody's had their input. Senator McClure had the thing on track, almost prepared to where we were going to pass it through the Congress with the Arizona bill. And, uh, and, and had agreement on both sides of the, of the Capitol Hill of, of what we could do. All we had to do was argue over between 1.2 million acres and 525,000 acres and get the lines drawn, and this thing would have been completed. Then the governor interferes in it and invites Congressman Cyberling and others to come out here, stirs the whole thing up. Then he comes up at the last Johnny-come-lately thing and says, now we haven't had enough meetings. Now we're going to go around the state and have five more meetings to solve this. And all I'm saying is he's a little after the fact. Now, so, what's so going to, what I'm saying is that if that happens, and I think already that it's touch and go whether this thing can be resolved now because of the, uh, all of the delay that's taken place, if it doesn't get resolved, then he's going to have an explanation to make to the thousands of people that work in the forest products if they start closing sawmills in the state as a result of an unavailable supplies of timber. And in your view, an Idaho wilderness bill perhaps could have passed already somewhere well, between pr probably could your pass. recommendation and a million. I think we had it pretty well on track to get it between a million two and 525,000 acres and the release language had been agreed to and, by and the cyber. And John Evans single-handedly mucked that up. Well, I don't know as he could, I could say single-handedly, but he certainly had a big hand in doing it. And particularly now, if, you wanna ha if he wants to have his five uh, regional hearings, he might as well kick it over into 1985. There's no way it can be done because Congress is about to adjourn. And there's only 30 more working days left of the time the Congress is actually in session. So it's going to be difficult at this point. I mean, Congressman Kostemeyer and others are now talking about they don't want 1.2 million. They want to start at 2.6 million, and Kostemeyer's bill is 3.6 million acres, that he wants additional wilderness. Well, that's totally unacceptable to most working Idahoans. Three-fourths of the people in Idaho are saying that they think we either have about the right amount of wilderness or the Idaho delegation bill puts it about in the right amount. They're happy with that much. They don't want any more. And I just don't understand why the governor is being so obstinate about it. Well, I think he says that the reason he, uh, he suggested this idea was because it didn't appear to him that you and Senator McClure and others who were working on this were making much progress from where you were coming from. Well, he didn't help any. You if we'd had a governor that was supporting the delegation bill, I think it would have been passed already. But see, what you've got is you have a governor telling members of Congress back there that the delegation doesn't represent the state. And I think we do represent the state. We just have a totally, I mean, I have to agree the governor is on the side of the people who want a lot more wilderness in the state than I think the overwhelming numbers of Idaho citizens want. And it's, a, it's a, I can't understand why anybody thinks they need a lot more wilderness than say four and a half million acres, which was the area where we were going to come down you in said, the National Forest. You said in that same news release last week about talking about Evans that uh, the vast majority of Idaho citizens see no need for additional wilderness. I how think do, that's how do you true. know that? Just from the surveys I've seen. What, what sort of surveys? Well, different surveys that have been taken with the different, uh, you know, political surveys and so forth. And just from holding town meetings. I mean, I go to, the, I have a town, I'm having, I'm working on having 44 town meetings in 44 counties this year. We're about half to two-thirds of the way through now. And just 
what people tell me everywhere I go, unless I talk to different people than the governor does. But the people I talk to tell me we've got too much already. And, you know, I go out to Sims Free Ranch once in a while and talk to the boys out there and see how they feel about it. And they say, what do you guys want all that wilderness for? We all go up, you know, on the weekends because we work. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, wilderness is a, is a legal term. We all love the outdoors and we want to conserve it and we want to have the beauty of Idaho protected so that we're going to be able to enjoy it in the future. But that doesn't mean that we need to legally classify it all as wilderness and pre prevent people from being able to earn a living uh, because of uh, unavailable timber supplies and so forth. So would you predict, Senator, that we will not have an Idaho wilderness bill out of this session of the Congress? No, not at this point. But I will predict that if we have an Idaho wilderness bill out of this session of Congress, that I'm not going to like it. Okay. And you might not support it? No, I wouldn't say that, but I, I can predict that it's going to be too big. It's going to have more wilderness than I think is good for the state. But, but my view is that we've got uh, thousands of families in the state that are counting on releasing some of those lands to multiple use. And if you notice, the name of the McClure bill is the uh, Forest Management Act because right. it symbolizes that we're going to release lands to multiple use. The wilderness focus seems to get all the attention, but the important focus that I've always looked at is we need to release about 8 million acres to, to multiple use. And that's very important that that be done. So I would hope that we could uh, get something done so that we'll have it settled and behind us. It should have been done several years ago, and, and it was much to my chagrin we didn't get it done in 1979. You, uh, let me just ask you about one more thing in this press release uh, last week. You said you were ready for wilderness to be the focus of the 86 campaign in Idaho. That almost sounds like an announcement. Well, what I'm saying is that if the governor and his supporters are mistakenly thinking that they can make, you know, help cobble this up and delay this issue and throw it over into 86 and then have that be the main issue. you'll be issue, happy to debate that with him, that, I guess, if that, he runs for the Senate. That I'd be happy to make that the issue because I'm convinced if you just want to run an election out here in Idaho, and I don't want to solve it there. I want to solve it and get it solved for those families because we're talking about people that are, will not be able to sell their homes. If Boise Cascade, say, for example, would close its mill somewhere, let's just say hypothetically, let's say they close the mill in Cascade. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. I've got, but I've got to ask you one more thing in 30 seconds. It hurts the people. It, w it won't hurt the big corporation. They can move is all I'm saying. The people can't. On August 14th here, what would you, where would you place uh, George Hansen's chances for re-election in two and a half months? Oh boy, I don't know. It's it's a tough uh, toss-up. It's a toss-up, I'd say. I mean, he's there's a lot can happen in the next two months. He, he doesn't look as good right now as it will be by November. He'll look a lot stronger in November than he looks now. It's always good to have you here, Senator. Thank you. appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. That's our time for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the Friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation.